Welcome. This is Brian Buchanan from Alberta Associated Sonography in the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Alberta. This tutorial is on optic nerve sheath diameter as a surrogate marker for intracranial pressure. This tutorial is designed for both the novice and more experienced point of care sonographer. Let's start here. Detection of elevated intracranial pressure, really the main focus of this tutorial. Diagnosis of elevated intracranial pressure is critical, but it's also challenging. Prompt recognition and access to immediate therapy is vital. While fundoscopy is widely accessible, it is not without its technical challenge. In fact, I do not routinely practice this technique and feel somewhat incompetent. Clinical exam features and CT findings are variable. This is from a recent systematic review meta-analysis. The, the clinical exam can, of course, show things like Cushing's triad and lateralizing findings, but these can be late findings and can also be nonspecific. A CT exam can also show signs of cerebral edema, but it's frankly not that sensitive. And so you may miss many patients who are early in their clinical course. Whether or not your clinical exam or CT demonstrates findings of elevated intracranial pressure matters little depending on your level of suspicion. If your pretest is high, this could necessitate treatment and transfer. More invasive techniques can play a role, including lumbar puncture with manometry, or placement of extraventricular or intraparenchymal devices in specialist neurocritical care units. However, often contraindications exist or the resources are simply unavailable or inaccessible. Enter the nerve sheath, a promising non-invasive tool to detect elevation intracranial pressure. The nerve sheath is contiguous with the dura mater and its contents are contiguous with the subarachnoid space in the brain. An elevation of intracranial pressure can lead to an increase in the diameter of the optic nerve sheath as you can see on screen left. Notably, a fibrous trabecular network connects the optic nerve to its sheath. And the density of this network can actually vary between individuals and where you are along the length of the optic nerve. Cerebral spinal fluid flows readily between the intracranial and intraorbital subarachnoid space. Therefore, these same areas are subject to the same pressure changes. Multiple studies, including ultrasound, CT, and MRI, demonstrate that indeed the diameter of the sheath does increase in size and is dynamic under changing conditions. These two images show an elevation of the nerve sheath diameter under pressures of ICP, in fact that it, after you treat the ICP it does reduce in size. There's been a lot of excitement around using the optic nerve sheath as a non-invasive surrogate for ICP. A recent meta-analysis published in the Annals of Internal Medicine looked at 4,551 patients in combining groups here for the sake of brevity, the pool sensitivity for optic nerve sheath for elevated ICP showed a sensitivity of 92 to 97% and a pool specificity of 86%. The optimal cutoff value was five millimeters. Another meta-analysis that looked at various modalities in diagnosing elevated ICP for this particular group, they examined 10 studies for a total of 1,035 patients to calculate the area under the ROC value for the detection of elevated ICP. There is various nerve sheath diameter thresholds across the different studies, along with corresponding sensitivity specificities, which really restricts the ability to do meta-analysis at a given threshold to calculate a sensitivity specificity. But the level, but the area under the ROC curve, or receiver operating curve, was high at 0.94, indicating a high degree of diagnostic accuracy. Let's talk about how to perform this technique. The probe is placed slightly on the closed upper eyelid. You can cover the upper eyelid with a thick layer of gel to prevent pressure being exerted on the eye. You can also add a tegaderm. This, this can reduce gel getting onto the cornea and causing irritation. You must position the probe to clearly display the entry of the optic nerve into the globe. Really, you want two measurements, transverse and sagittal. You want to average these two measurements for each eye, and this should be repeated for the other eye as well. You can average all these measurements together and give one value as the eyes should be symmetrical. Asymmetry may point to potential underlying pathology that is unrelated to intracranial pressure. It is important here, as you can see, to brace your hand to, to minimize ex exerting pressure on the globe. In this example here, we can see the anechoic sphere or globe with the caliber placed directly behind the papillar optic disc. You measure three millimeters behind this point with the caliper. You then measure directly across this area from one edge of the sheet to the other. At this time, you might think to yourself, geez, this looks quite subtle. And you'd be right, but there'll be more on this later. How do we enhance visualization? Well, first of all, you can turn down the dynamic range to reduce the grayscale spectrum to better see tissue planes. You can also use dynamic cine loops to help delineate the nerve sheath margins. 
which is frankly a bit easier to see than in static images. We also encourage you to take multiple measurements to reduce intra-rater variability that is possible with this technique. Finally, while poorly studied, it may actually help to get images of the nerve sheet that are off-axis to reduce the shadowing artifact. I noticed that in reading the literature, depending on which reference you read, the others say behind the papilla or behind the globe. It might make little difference in the overall measurement, but this may change if there is papilla edema. As we can see in this image here, here we see an elevated optic disc when we're fanning in and out of plane. And in fact, it is bulging to the globe. Interestingly, pseudopapilla edema can imitate this elevation of the optic nerve sheath secondary to a to buried optic nerve head drusen or an anomalous optic nerve. So nerve sheath enlargement should be found coincident with elevation of the optic disc. At this point, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm ready, Let, let's go, let's do this. Looks like a simple, straightforward technique. I wanna tell you, there are some problems with this technique and here's where things get really weird. First of all, there's a list of potential false positives. I'm an ICU doctor, and I can't claim to have any special knowledge on most of these conditions. I would suggest you need to be aware of any medical problems, like thyroid disease, or neurological issues with visual acuity that suggest optic neuritis. I suspect that gross asymmetry may further heighten your senses of a potential false positive. The next thing is, where do you measure? I've had many discussions with my colleagues about this very point, and again, it's somewhat unclear from the literature. Now the number three millimeters was selected as as you go further behind the eye along the optic nerve, there tends to be more fibrous adhesions that prevent distal expansion of the nerve sheath. At three millimeters, we suggest the outer edges of the nerve sheath, not the inner edges. In this case, it is the teal arrow measurement. As the optic nerve sheath enlarges and the sheath actually may become edematous, this may make it more challenging to see the margins. Multiple researchers have noted anecdotally that some patients are even more difficult to delineate margins than others, regardless of intracranial pressure. This falls from the previous slide. One concern is that there is lots of acoustic shadowing from the lamina cribrosa, or even the optic disc. The lamina cribrosa is a small hole in the sclera with a multi-layered network of collagen that allows the optic nerve to penetrate the globe. This is literally all I'll say about this, as this deep, dark pit of knowledge only gets deeper. Copetti in 2009 actually gives a fair warning that we're not measuring what we think we're measuring. In this super small study, he analyzed the path of the optic nerve by applying color Doppler. This color Doppler was applied to the central retinal artery. In this diagram, he shows us that on the left, what we think is the optic nerve is in fact an artifact. On the diagram to the right, we can see that the nerve in fact takes a tangential path. In fact, here we see the same patient's eye image in different planes. This shows us that the same patient, the optic nerve, when the eye is in the central or lateral position with vastly different measurements. Copetti attributed this incidence of the ultrasound beam on the lamina cribrosa. He also points out that multiple authors at the time had used the image on the left as their optic nerve sheath measurement. This raises some concerns. In fact, some experts encourage the use of A-mode ultrasound, which is one dimensional ultrasound which can be used to measure very specific distances based on the pulse echo principle. This is a really bizarre kind of ultrasound, but in fact, as I understand it, this approach is much more common in the realm of ophthalmology where they're measuring exact distances. Nonetheless, this has not stopped researchers from comparing measurements to more advanced techniques, including in this one, which used a three Tesla MRI machine. Interestingly, optic nerve sheath quantification by ultrasound and MRI three millimeters behind the papilla demonstrated good reproducibility with an R value greater than 0.75 with mean differences of less than 2% on average of optic nerve sheath values. Other researchers have been unable to draw correlations between ultrasound and MRI. In fact, Raval et al. found poor correlation of optic nerve sheath diameter by ultrasound to MRI in various different planes, as demonstrated screen left. It is unclear what differences are in the, in the two above studies, and both used high quality three Tesla MRI machines. This has left me with the question of what exactly are we measuring? There is no question there's lots of artifact in the measurement when the nerve emerges directly in the center of the screen. In fact, may be better if it emerges laterally. But perhaps our system of classification, in a way, works. It's incorrect, but perhaps consistently so. Like in the way you measure a shoe print, but then you see the foot. I do think our approach will need to be refined, but it also probably needs to be restudied in these populations with large subgroups, including traumatic brain injury, hepatic encephalopathy, and other kinds of medical illnesses. 
The other issue is the cutoff. The most commonly cited cutoff is 5 millimeters or 0.5 centimeters. However, this is remarkably inconsistent across a broad range of studies. This is why meta-analysis struggled to produce a pooled sensitivity specificity. It is clear to some extent that the bigger the number, the more significant it is, because there likely is some degree of linear correlation. The higher the number of nerve sheath, the more likely it is that they have increasing severity of intracranial pressure. I've had patients with nerve sheath diameters that approach 7 to 8 millimeters, which have gone on to have brainstem herniation. And I have to remark that this is in the presence of a normal head CT, but at least a high pretest probability. There's likely some anatomic explanations for this, but also measurement explanations. But I think this is one thing that, that our community of researchers and point of care ultrasonographers really needs to work on. And finally, I want to cover an issue that I think few have explored um, in discussions on using this technique. Many will say to lower the up power output to be as low as reasonably achievable. The mechanical index itself is an indicator of the rel relative potential for an ultrasound to induce an adverse non-thermal bio effect, such as cavitation or bubble formation. The thermal index is an indicator of the rel relative potential for tissue temperature rise. So in this case, the mechanical index should be actually reduced to, a, to at least 0.2 or lower and thermal index to at least zero. And what I've noticed in a lot of point of care machines, it can be a struggle to reduce the mechanical index and thermal index as these machines really have customized exam settings and they don't allow necessarily for customization of the power output. I think this is where a lot of the manufacturers need, need to look at this heavily as this, as this technique is being employed more frequently this needs to be addressed. Now onto the summary. So optic nerve diameter is a promising non-invasive tool to detect elevations in intracranial pressure. It's relatively easy to perform, but there are caveats like false positives. There are measurement errors. Optic nerve sheath margins can be unclear and different from patient to patient and with increasing cerebral edema. There's problems with artifact. In fact, MRI may actually better measure optic nerve sheath diameter but I, sus but I suspect there is not as much literature to support the various patient populations versus optic nerve sheath. And I think we do have a bit of a measuring footprint issue with using optic nerve sheath where we calibrated our footprint to the population but not the foot. And we need to keep mechanical index and thermal index as low as reasonably achievable, but we need, we need to talk to our point of care machine manufacturers to make this more customized. And 5 millimeter is the current cutoff, which probably offers the high sensitivity, but greater than 5.5 millimeters offers greater specificity. And this really needs to be honed in the literature in the future with increasing patient populations in, in the study of, in, of different subgroups. And the final question is, how much training is really required in this technique? I know in showing my colleagues, it's actually far more challenging to reproduce than you would think. I want to thank you for listening. You can follow us at ualberta underscore sono. Bye for now.